Good evening. My name is Kendra Straub and I work here in the Smokies in the superintendent's office. Welcome to the virtual public meeting for the proposed updates to the fee program. First, we would like to cover a few housekeeping items. All participants other than our presenters will be in listen only mode throughout the duration of the meeting. That's to reduce background noise so that all participants can hear the entirety of the presentation. Shortly when the meeting starts, the chat function will no, will no longer be activated. We request that all questions be put into the Q&A function, which you should see on the bottom of your screen. You can add questions at any time during the presentation, and in fact, many of you are already doing so. At the end of the presentation, we will have a Q&A session in which we will try to address as many questions as time allows. Now, I would like to turn it over to Superintendent Cash. Hi, good afternoon. As introduced, I'm Cash is Cash, the superintendent here at the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. First of all, let me just say thank you for taking time out of your, uh, your busy schedule to spend an hour with us to talk about uh, the proposals that I'm sure many of you have seen or heard about or seen in the news by now. We're going to talk about that in depth, and as, as the moderator said, that we're going to have questions and answers. One of the things that my staff and I decided that if this proposal goes forward, we want to make sure that we get it right. And we feel that talking with you and having the discussions and really laying the proposals out to you ensures that we do that. Now, as we know that this is the most visited national park in the country, and we're very, very proud of that. And we, we honor that privilege to be able to serve the millions of people that come to this park year in and year out. 14.1 million people, that's 57% increase in visitation over the last 10 years. Now, what that means to me is a couple of good things. One is that we have millions of new visitors that are coming to the park for the first time and discovering their new love for being out in the natural world. Two, it shows to me that this park continues to grow as an economic engine for this community, the surrounding gateway communities. For example, for every federal dollar that is spent, $50 are returned back to our surrounding communities. I would say that's a pretty good deal. And then the third one, which really strikes at the core mission of the National Park Service, with this many visitors, it says to me that the National Park Service, in particular the Smokies, is gonna be relevant for the next generation. Now, I'm not naive to not believe that um, some of you oppose the proposals. And I wanna to talk to you this evening. Hopefully through the presentations and through the questions and answers, that you hear three things that serve as my motivation. And I will go as far as to say as my inspiration. One are the employees at this park. These employees at the park bring it every day. And as we've gone through the significant increase in visitors, they simply need help. Two is that this park, <clears throat> the, the second thing I thought about was the visitor services and experiences. To me, that equates to memories. It's the memories that have kept people and generations of people to keep coming back to this park year after year after year. And third, which is part of the Park Service mission, is to ensure that we keep this, these cultural resources, these natural resources, administrative buildings intact so that the young people that are enjoying this park today, when they bring their kids back, that it'll still be there for them the way that we are joining it today. So I look forward to having some robust dialogue with you and having questions and answers um, that we're going to address this evening. I'm going to turn it over now to Dana Soren, which serves as my chief of staff. And I want to say, uh, I'm going to embarrass her, but I want to say that she's extended a lot of uh, tireless hours on these proposals and a lot of leadership. So with that being said, I'm going to turn it over to you, Dana. Thank you and good evening, everyone. Give me just a minute and I'm gonna share my screen so we can share some of this information in a little more detail for you. And Superintendent Cash introduced me, I'm Dana Sowen, and I have served in Great Smoky Mountains National Park for 32 years. So I am very invested in this park and I'm very invested in this community. And that's not unlike many of you who are with us tonight. And we've heard from you. We've, we've heard a lot 
of comments and questions over the last week since we launched the announcement about the Park It Forward program. And one of the things that's a really good news about that is that there's so much common ground. Everyone agrees that this park needs more resources and that it's critically important that it's preserved so that the next generation of users, like, like all of us, can enjoy it the same way we do today. And that's what drives us. There's been a couple of questions that we've had repeatedly. One of them is, why now? And one of them is, how and when did the Smokies history provide for this? What, what's the history about these in the Smokies, uh, you know, creation of the park. And so before we dive into the proposal details, I just want to touch on addressing those couple of questions. And I'm hoping my screen is sharing now. Okay, I'm getting a thumbs up that it's out there. And I'm going to go ahead then and, and just dive in to start to that, that why now question. This park provides incredible experiences. And it's our mission as the employees to provide those experiences in a way that leaves this park preserved. And behind the scenes of every one of these experiences that you see on my screen is an enormous body of work that for most people, you wouldn't even notice it. Uh, we're protecting water quality so we can support those high quality fisheries. We are doing lots of trail maintenance on the 850 miles of trails. And we're, we're making sure that we're maintaining 384 miles of roadways in this park for, for scenic motorist experiences. And we're operating custodial services and trash removal emergency services. And we're operating 27 different wastewater systems in this park and providing clean drinking water, all in a 500,000 acre wilderness setting. It takes an enormous amount of services to make sure we're providing those great visitor experiences. And with 14.1 million visits, our staff are strained to provide this care. And our facilities and our resources are strained. And for years, we've been applying a lot of band-aid fixes to meet our needs. We've shifted our donation dollars to support operational needs. We've chased grant monies. We've chased project dollars. But with this extreme demand for visitor services in our park and the use, we simply can't meet the needs without drastically cutting services or access to the park. In the last 10 years, as Superintendent Cash said, our visitation has increased 57%. And this is not just a pandemic response. We've been feeling this strain from extreme rises in visitation for years. During the same time frame, Park visitation around the country has increased at about 7%. And while we're not the only park that's experiencing high visitation, I can tell you it's, it's just on a different scale here in the Smokies. So in this slide, you're seeing the top 10 most visited national parks in 2021. And you can see that the Smokies visitation is triple or more the visitation in these other parks. And another way to look at it, is that if you took all the visitors who went to Yellowstone, Grand Canyon, and Yosemite, Everglades, Petrified Forest combined last year, that's the same number of visitors that we supported right here in the Smokies with a fraction of the support. And if you take a look at the amount of funding that we have per visitor, you can see it's well below the average. And we believe that the Smokies visitors serve more and that our staff deserve more resources to care for this really amazing place. With our current revenue to balance our budgets, we've had to reduce our law enforcement staffing by 18% and our maintenance staff by 32%, all at a time when we need them more than ever before. And so we are at a crossroads and our Park It Forward program asks that visitors like they do at all other national parks, start to financially contribute to the care of the resources 
and the experiences that they've come here to enjoy. And so now we're going to jump in to the Smokies history of how and when these can be charged. This is the how. So national parks get funding for operations in, in several different ways. First, there's the base funding, and that's represented here in orange. And that comes from the federal government or, or our tax dollars. And it's just simply not enough to support our current operations or operations in any other national park. And Congress recognized this long ago, and they provided these other funding tools and authorities for parks to charge user fees, which they felt was more appropriate than providing more tax dollar revenue to support parks. So let's just take a closer look at the fee funding. And, and you can see in the Smokies that our fee revenue is relatively small, about $3 million that we receive for our campground fee revenues. The average fee revenue of parks, our same complexity and size, is $22 million a year. That's more than our base budget. And most of these parks also have a robust concession program that provides revenue from lodging and restaurants. Again, in the Smokies, we have a very small concessions program by design. Those services are, are primarily outside the park to provide that economic uh, benefit that Superintendent Cash spoke about. At other parks, on average, they receive about $15 million in concessions revenue, that other flexible spending to help meet their operational needs. And then the last source is donation dollars. The Smokies has an incredible philanthropic um, body of support with Friends of the Smokies and Great Smoky Mountains Association. And when both of those organizations were formed, their intent was to provide a margin of excellence and to support signature projects. But unfortunately, we've had to rely on them over the last decade just to meet operational needs. Their funds are being used for seasonals, for custodial services, and to pay for ut utilities in the park. In total, these extra revenue sources provide about 20% of the Smokies budget. In comparison to the other parks, again, our same complexity and size, it provides 60% of their operational needs. So this is a little bit of the background of the how parks increase revenue, including the Smokies. But now we get into the question about the Smokies history of how and when these can be charged. This is the most asked question that we've received. And it, it's a hard answer to give. And like most descendants, the descendant family that I married into 31 years ago from the Sugarlands and the Elkmont areas of the park, we've long heard the story about the promise of the free access that was given because of the descendants selling their lands for the creation of this great park. And while they did receive pavement, this was still a significant sacrifice. They gave up their, their communities, their way of life. And then our tribal neighbors, they experienced two great periods of sacrifice, both in the 1800s when they were forcibly removed from their ancestral tribal lands. And then again, some of them at the, the time of the park's creation. These are hard stories. And it's very frustrating for descendants to hear that they're simply just were no agreements for forever free access at the time of the park's creation. Not in the enabling legislation for the park, not from President Roosevelt, not in the hundreds of historical documents and deeds, and not when the logging companies sold their land for the creation of this park, making up about 85% of park lands, and not when individuals sold their lands for the creation of the park. Stories. So why can't we charge an entrance fee if there aren't any agreements? That's what leads us to this next question. And it all comes down to the state of Tennessee and a deed restriction that they put in place more than a decade after the park's establishment. In 1951, the state of Tennessee transferred the deed for Newfound Gap Road and Little River Road to the park with a deed restriction that stated no tolls could be charged to use those two roads. This single deed restri restriction affects us today because of a federal statute 
in Title 16 that says if we can't charge tolls on our primary roads, then we can't charge tolls to use the roads <coughs> elsewhere in the park or, or, or entrance fees. Now, this deed restriction does not prohibit the park from charging user fees. Um, that authority is given under the Federal Land Recreation Enhancement Act, or FLORIA. And this allows us to charge for things like camping in our front country and our back country. And parks can also charge for parking under this authority, either in addition to entrance fees or as a standalone user fee. And several park units that don't charge entrance fees charge for parking under this authority. In the Smokies, all fees collected under this authority stay in the Smokies for the direct benefit of visitors, thanks to Senator Bill Frist of, of Tennessee, who in 1998 introduced legislation in the Land Water Conservation Act to ensure that this fee money would stay right here in the Smokies. And we believe the time is now to more fully use this authority to help take care of the Smokies. Through the proposed Park It Forward program, we would charge a modest fee for parking under Floria. In the Smokies, the program would work pretty much like it does on a university campus, where you can tour the campus by car and you don't need a parking tag. But if you park on campus to attend a class, go to a ball game, go to the library, then you better have a tag. In the park, it would work very similarly. You can tour the park by car. You can enjoy a scenic drive. You can commute through the park. But if you park to use facilities, the trails, the picnic areas, then we would be asking that you now help contribute to the care of those resources. So again, the tags would not be required for, for simply enjoying the scenic drive. Park roads would remain toll-free, and there would continue to be no charge to enter the park. Compliance for the parking tag program would consist of several tools. Um, you know, building awareness is one of the greatest tools we have to work towards compliance of something so new in a park that's nearly 90 years old. This change will take time. We want to be able to provide ample opportunities for people to learn about the tags, to be able to understand where they can get them and, and how to use them. And staff funded through this program would, would not only be checking for that compliance, but also providing just traditional ranger guidance out in the field. And that's something that we've heard again and again from our visitors is they want to see more rangers out in the field, helping them where they are. So as a part of the compliance program, you know, the, these staff can provide courtesy reminders or law enforcement staff have the discretion to provide courtesy reminders. Similarly to if you're camping, you leave your cooler out and then you have a food violation, get a little courtesy reminder. That's one piece. There's also verbal warnings and, and written warnings. And they do have the authority to issue citations. But again, we know it's going to take time. And our law enforcement rangers will, will, will exercise discretion just like they do across the park. Just recognizing that growing awareness will, will, will take months, maybe years, as we grow this program. And the tags would be available in advance through our online store at, with our partner, Great Smoky Mountains Association, and the Smoky Store, and also on site through automated fee machines and visitor centers and, and other, other venues outside the park, and stores and hotels. We want to make them widely available so, so people have the opportunity to participate easily. And our intent is not to use the tags as an economic barrier. Um, we would not limit the tag sales to limit or cap visitation in the park. The tags also will not guarantee a parking spot at, at a specific location. Parking would just continue to be available on a first-come, first-served basis. And that will require trip planning for people who want to go to, you know, one of the seven or so sites that are the most popular, busiest sites in the park where there just simply isn't enough parking to meet demand. And we, we, we can't build enough parking to meet the demand. 
that people have to hike Alum Cave Trail and Laurel Falls Trail just simply isn't enough space. But in the future, we also plan to eliminate the out-of-bounds roadside parking to protect our resources, to improve the pedestrian and motorist safety, and to improve traffic flow through these congested areas. With our high visitation and reduced staffing that we've been experiencing, this poor parking, poor stewardship behavior um, has really developed over the last several years. And it's just no longer acceptable for, for people to tear up our roadsides and, and block traffic when parking. And this change won't happen overnight, uh, but we are taking steps in the right direction. So as a part of the how, let, let's also talk about the scope of the program and how it would help meet our revenue goals. So from our 14.1 million visits, we know that this equates to about 5 million vehicles. And we also know that based on survey data, that about 13% of our visitors spend very little time outside of their cars. Um, and we can assume they're, they're driving through and would not need a tag. This program will not change the way those visitors tour the park. So based on the number of times visitors come uh, from our surveys, we estimate that about 3 million vehicles would be required <laughs> to have a parking tag. So depending on the, the type of tag you choose, um, the final pricing point of the tag, we believe we can achieve our revenue goals at a very modest um, parking tag rate. Again, the intent is not to have an economic barrier because of this program. That's our goal. We propose a daily parking tag of $5, a parking tag for up to seven days for $15, and an annual tag really targeted for, for our local residents at $40, who we know are going to come multiple times a year. And we want to make it more convenient. Um, the proposed rates and, and duration were determined by considering a comparison of rates for similar access on both private and other public lands. And the average parking rate in gateway communities where, where parking fees are charged is $15 per day and, and $68 per month. The national park sites where parking fees are currently charged, the average rate is about $9 per day and $50 per year. These monies, again, would stay in the park and be used to directly benefit our visitors, like increasing our law enforcement presence and coverage and emergency response times increasing facility maintenance and preventative maintenance to help those facilities last a little longer and increasing our educational programs and habitat restoration directly related to, to recreation like wildlife viewing and fishing. These funds would allow us a chance to address the needs of today in a manner that provides that long-term stewardship for the future. So that's both the why and the how for the Park It Forward program. And now I, I want to spend just a few minutes on the other fee program changes we're introducing, and that is to increase our camping fees in both our front country and our back country. Both of these fees are, are also charged through the Floria Authority, and we haven't increased these fees in alignment with inflation. It's been 10 years since we increased the backcountry fees and, and six years since we increased the front country fees. So the backcountry fee program was implemented in 2013, and we've seen steady use since then. And that's important because when we implemented this fee, we had a lot of people that thought that use would decline. But you can see that that, that didn't happen. In fact, we've had some of our highest years on record in this 10-year period. And we've experienced the 39% increase in backcountry overnight use since the program was implemented. And it's came at, at great benefit to our users. So with the user fees, we provide seven-day coverage uh, in our office to be able to provide really critical trip planning advice. Uh, they're fielding 17,000 calls a year, providing guidance on, on where to camp, access how to get there, trail routes to get there, and they're giving them really good safety messages and preventative search and rescue to help them prepare
for a Smokies experience. We've hired in the back country two law enforcement rangers. We've also been able to perform campground maintenance and, and we've worked with volunteers and trail partners to, to leverage those monies as we work together to provide those maintenance. And with our current fee rate, we've maximized our staffing and our field presence based on our current revenues. So the proposed fee increases are critically important to ensure that we can continue to provide this level of service, even with inflation, and to be able to grow the program into the future. So here's the current range of backcountry fees and parks with similar programs. And the average cost for a single night in these parks is $17. Now, most of these parks charge uh, an additional reservation fee per permit, which has already been factored in. And we are not proposing in the Smokies to charge a reservation fee. Our current rate in the Smokies is $4 per person per night, which is well below the average, as you can see. Um, and we're proposing to raise this rate to $8. And while still below the average, we believe our proposed rate is reasonable to meet our program needs. So again, we propose raising that, that per person per night fee from, from four to eight dollars. And then the maximum permit rate for a seven night permit per person from $20 to $40. In comparison, the average maximum permit for a seven night permit per person is $54. And then we also propose raising the Appalachian Trail through hiker permit to $40. And these increases will, again, allow us to appropriately continue to, to increase our services. Um, and here's just a quick snapshot, again, of how we use those funds both to allow us to continue to provide that, that critical campsite maintenance in the backcountry, backcountry patrols with our law enforcement rangers, increasing those patrols, and adding some new trip planning tools uh, to help people even more uh, before they get out in the backcountry. And now to the front country fee increases we're proposing. Um, for this assessment, we based the proposed fees on our operational needs and then also the comparability rates with facilities neighboring the park that offer similar services. As you can imagine, that can be tough as our sites are pretty primitive, um, but we were able to, again, base it on like campgrounds outside the park. So we propose raising our family campground rates to $30 for standard sites, $36 for sites with electrical hookups. And we propose increasing our fruit camps, our horse camps, and our picnic pavilions by between 20 and 30%, just depending on the, the size, the capacity of the sites, and the location. And the differences be between the sites are based on the amenities that are available at each one of those sites. And you can find a full breakdown by site on our website if you want to look at each one of those in detail. Um, we also propose increasing the daily rental rates for the Appalachian Clubhouse and, and the Spence Cabin in Elkmont uh, to $300 for the Appalachian Clubhouse and $200 for the Spence Cabin, no matter the day of the week. These fees will, will directly support our, our campground operations and maintenance to again, provide those high quality visitor experiences that the public has come to expect. And it's critically important for our staff to be able to have the resources to provide those kind of resources. And again, all the fees stay in the Smokies, just like the proposed park it forward fees will stay in the Smokies to be able to support this great park. So that's the end of our proposal, um, including again, but the why, that the time is now to implement these fees. And the how and the what we'll be spending these fee revenues towards. And with that, we'd like to try to answer any questions that you may have. We have had a lot of engagement in our Q&A and we are, we are so grateful for all of that. Thank you to everyone who has already submitted questions. You can continue to submit questions for the remainder of the meeting and we will try to address as many as we can. To start off with, 
we've had some questions about tribal access as it relates to the parking tag program. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Kendra. And, and also let me extend my thanks to folks. Uh, the questions are coming in, very good questions. In regards to um, uh, tribal citizens, particularly the Eastern Band of the Cherokee, um, you know, we have a unique relationship with the uh, um, federally, federally recognized tribes, and that is rooted in the Constitution and further solidified with treaties, laws, statutes, and court cases. Out West or any part that have interest fees that has been under a longstanding uh, park service uh, regulation to allow tribal members for traditional purposes to have access to national park system lands. If this proposal moves forward uh, with the parking fee, that would that would be the same uh, as well with that to allow um, Native American citizens to have access for traditional purposes as well. Thank you. Um, we've also had a number of questions about um, discounts related to residents of, of counties that, that border the park. Yep, I've had that question quite a bit uh, here locally as well. Uh, so when we design the, 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 the format that Dana has gone over, the, the price of it, uh, we, we kept in mind the, the price sensitivity. We want to make sure that this is not an economic barrier, first of all, for people to continue to enjoy their park. And then we added the feature for um, the annual pass, and that's specifically uh, identified for locals. Uh, as well, you know, being a part that's within an eight hour drive uh, with ha of half of the United States population, it was imperative that we had an annual pass so that folks that visit the park uh, many times um, on, a, on a yearly basis would continue to have that, that access. So we built um, the annual pass specifically for the residents. Thank you, Superintendent Cash. We've also had a lot of operational questions and, and how the parking tag will be implemented. One of them is, you know, is the parking tag or would the parking tag be per person or per vehicle and, and could it be transferred between vehicles? Okay, thank you. Um, the parking tag is per vehicle, not per person. And the implementation of, of how we will apply, whether it's it applies to two cars in a household or, or one car in a household. Those are some of the implementation issues that we're working through right now. And we do appreciate your input to see what best meets your needs. I can tell you that as we've talked about it, we know there are some, some compliance challenges that come along with having one tag be transferable to more than one car, especially in a park with, without the digital connectivity for us to, to easily check for compliance. But again, we welcome your input. That's exactly the, the kind of information that will help us um, make this TAG program user-friendly uh, if we move forward with it. So thank you. Thank you. We've, we've also had some, some questions about um, entrance fees in the park and if, if this parking TAG program is, is sort of an alternative to or, or a way to get around entrance fees. Yeah, so uh, thank you for that question. So parking fees and entry fees are both allowed under FLORIA. Um, Congress passed this law particularly because they understood that the appropriated dollars that we get on an annual basis cannot cover all of our associated costs with providing services to the million, millions of visitors that we get on an annual basis. So Dana's gone extensively over uh, the reason why we can't charge an entrance fee. So management here, me namely, chose to use what we call an expanded amenity authority uh, under Florida. And that's where the parking fee comes into play. And because we have, as I said before, because we have the deed restriction, we only have one option with that. So uh, it's not a way to get around, it's just exercising what's already under the law. Um, Dana also mentioned that there are some parks that actually exercise both uh, expanded uh, expanded amenity fee and the entrance fee, but so that's where we are. Thanks. Thank you, Superintendent Cash. Uh, we've also seen several questions that really all get at how or or would the parking tag program relieve congestion? Is it going to solve parking issues? Well, the parking tag in and of itself 
will not solve the congestion issues that we have in the park. Um, the tags will not be capped. They won't be limited to try to limit visitation. The tags will not be tied to a reservation across the park. So the tag in and of itself will not help us solve the congestion. But the revenues that we generate through the Smokies, you know, Park It Forward program will now give us the resources to continue to try to implement some of the congestion management strategies that we started piloting at, again, the park's busiest sites. Um, so there's not one kind of like silver bullet that helps us look at each situation to manage congestion in all the same ways. Uh, but I can tell you that that's something that we have a team that is also addressing and, and looking at sources uh, to help us solve those, those really complex challenges across the park. Thank you. We've also received a number of questions um, about whether or not there would be some sort of discount for Interagency America the Beautiful passes. So the America the Beautiful passes get discounts specifically for entrance fees. That's the way the policy is written. It's the, the, the authority that is given to provide those discounts. But that is something that our implementation team is looking very carefully at now to see if, if there's a possibility to use the America Beautiful Passes specifically, the access passes, that's the one that's provided for um, permanently disabled people, and, and then also the, the senior passes. Those two passes in particular, um, we know that we are able to apply to discounts in our, in our camping program under FLORIA. So specifically, we're, we're looking at those, but, but also at the other pass types. And again, we welcome your input as, as we try to look at that a little bit closer. Thank you. Uh, we've had a number of folks just kind of wondering whether there's a concern or consideration for the parking tag program reducing the ability of, of low income visitors to access park facilities. So uh, good question. So our intent is not to have these parking passes serve as, as a barrier to them enjoying the national park. As a matter of fact, we were very conscientious of about being uh, price sensitive when we outlined um, the different levels of costs associated with the days the parking passes would be good for. And if you remember the comparisons um, that Dana showed within her presentation, Hopefully you can see that we were still below on a lot of under the passes that are comparable to what we're proposing were still below those costs. So we were very sensitive to that. And again, it's not our intent to, to have this pass be as an economic barrier. Another thing that I wanted to pinpoint that there are at least seven uh, free days uh, that is recognized on a national level by the National Park Service. And we uh, intend to have those free days associated with our parking pass. And through collaboration with local communities, if we feel there is one or two, maybe more that we need to have in, in, um, in this park, uh, based on that sensitivity, then those are conversations we can have with our local uh, leaders here if we feel that is necessary. So thank you. Thank you. And the, the next question um, really is around, you know, if this program were to be adopted, in the park receive that additional revenue, what would some of the park's priorities be for, for utilizing that revenue? Yeah, so good question. Um, so one of the things that uh, Dana gave a couple of stats on was the amount of um, law enforcement we've had to reduce over the years, we have to make some tough decisions. Um, and the amount of maintenance staff that we've had to reduce as well over the last couple of years. Uh, those are our largest two uh, divisions within the park. And because of that, when we've had to make the books balanced, we've had to make some tough decisions with that. Now, I say this facetiously, but, but when I get fan mail about things that we can do better, they're usually associated with those two divisions. And so when it comes to prioritization, I'm going to be looking very hard at those two divisions to make sure that we can have more rotations on, on bathroom cleaning, that we can have more rotations on trash pickup, 
that we can have more law enforcement officers to respond readily uh, when someone is in need in the back country. So there's a whole list of things uh, in those two divisions particularly that I really want to have prioritized as my top priority. I do want to underscore that there are other divisions here that serve a critical purpose uh, in making sure that this park stays intact. Uh, but when it comes to these particular dollars, I want to focus on those. And then one last point is that uh, David talked about the scope of this project. You know, those, those monies that stay within the park are not all for jobs. There are, there are guidelines and regulations to how we can spend those monies. And some of that is associated with how much we put into infrastructure. And it does allow us to have some um, staffing uh, needs being met that are catered to towards uh, business services. So we, we intend to expand as much as possible on all those percentages of where we can spend those monies uh, that are generated from the parking pass if this proposal moves forward. Thank you. Um, we've had some questions also about just, just where the parking tag would be required. Would it be all parking lots within the park? Yeah, so the parking tag will be required in any parking lot, any designated parking spot across the park. So whether you're hiking in Abrams Creek, you're having a picnic at Balsam Mountain, or you know, you're in Cataluchi uh, touring the historic cabins, we feel like this appropriately applies the, the same tool for visitors to be able to help provide for the care of those resources, no matter where they are in the park. Thank you. And, and we've had a number of questions regarding enforcement of the parking tag if, if the program were to be adopted and, and could tickets be written and, and how would the park enforce it? Yeah, I think this is a, a, a piece of, a portion of the presentation that Dana talked about. And I just want to reiterate that uh, if this proposal moves forward with us having parking tags, uh, that the education is going to be the tip of the spear for us. You know, this park uh, is 88 years old, and um, there have been generations of folks uh, that have visited here um, with the understanding that parking tags were not a requirement. And we don't expect for that switch to flip overnight. And so education is gonna be uh, the front, the, the first leg of how we bring up the park, people understanding what the needs are. And also, as Dana said, that we always give our officers discretion, uh, but I assure you that we will be talking with our law enforcement officers to, understand, to, to get in alignment with that. This is how we wanna roll this out. Uh, and another way that I look at it too, you know, um, some people say, well, what happens if I don't, you know, have a parking tag or whatever? You know, we we don't catch everybody that speaks through the park, right? Uh, and the same thing would be with parking. Now, that's not encouraging people to not buy tags, but we can only do so much. And we feel education is more of an effective tool of using than citations. Thank you. How much revenue does the park estimate would be collected through the proposed parking tag program? Well, if you start to take the best estimate we, we possibly can at which type of tag we think visitors based on past use might choose, we look at how many visitors we, we think truly only come once a year and they come one time and would probably want that, that $5 tag or, or maybe it's just a few times a year they come. And how many visitors do we think, again, based on their, their visitor patterns over the, the last several years would want that up to seven day tag and then the annual tag. So when we start to break those down based on the survey data available to us, it's roughly, we believe about 50% of our visitors would likely want the annual tag. And then, you know, another half would be sort of evenly divided between that daily tag and the weekly tag. So that's our very gross estimate. And again, we're basing that on, on the 3 million vehicles that we believe will, will likely need the tag. So you can imagine just doing some, some simple math and, and thinking about growing that compliance um, it, over, over that course of the early years. You can see that we, we can meet our revenue goals, which our goals now are, are to try to generate at least you know, 10 to $15 million in sustainable annual funds that can support our operational needs. As visitation increases, 
those funds would appropriately increase. Visitation takes a dip, the funds would appropriately decline. That's our goal. And, and again, we believe, especially based on uh, as we grow compliance, that we're going to be able to, to meet the revenue goals. Thank you. And, and a number of participants have been asking a variety of questions about out of bounds um, parking and, and sort of, you know, what is it and how does the park plan to eliminate it? Won't this potentially reduce the amount of parking that's available to visitors? Well, if you've been to the park over the last couple of years, you've seen the out of bounds parking. Again, at about seven locations, Allen Cave Parking, Laurel Falls Parking, our, our Grotto Falls Trilling Gap Parking on, on Roaring Fork Motor Nature Trail. And then a couple of areas you might not even expect it, but during a couple of months of the year at, at Big Creek, uh, and then a couple of other months at, at Deep Creek, and then Cleveland's Dome, Keats Coves. Those are the locations where we really have congestion issues, and we really have serious out-of-bound parking issues. And again, it's grown over time as the demand has far exceeded the amount of available parking. It's our job to make sure that we're preserving those roadside corridors and we're providing safe access. So we believe it's vitally important for us to eliminate that unsafe parking and parking that is destroying some of those roadside communities and, and the infrastructure associated with road shoulders. So yes, there will be less opportunities for, for people to have that behavior of parking wherever they want to, even if it's unsafe and it, it's tearing up the resources. It's the best thing for the park though. And it's the best thing to, to protect the safety of the visitors getting out of their car and at accessing that, that trailhead, walking along a, a really busy roadway, two-way traffic on a mountain road, people coming through there and then having to dodge, you know, several family members as they're trying to make their way to the trailhead. We are looking, as I said, at those locations to see how we can accommodate access in a better, safer way. And so it could be that, you know, as we start to eliminate that roadside parking, we're also trying to provide more options for people. Perhaps we might be able to look at some, some pilot shuttle systems. We experimented a little bit with that at, at Laurel Falls. So, so our goal is to provide high quality, safe access. We cannot build our way out of providing that by, by building more parking areas. But we'll never have enough parking areas to provide uh, the level of demand that we have for those trails. We're hoping that, that people, when they get to those spaces and, and find the parking lots are full, that they'll start help letting us help them a little bit with trip planning. Picking the time of year, picking the time of day, uh, picking some other similar locations with uh, 150 different trails, 850 miles of trail in the park. There are plenty of options for people to uh, experience a, a trail experience if we can just help them find some of those spaces and, and spread out our use appropriately. So, so those are some of our goals as we, uh, again, we feel start to appropriately address those, those congestion issues uh, with the roadside parking. Thank you. There's been uh, several questions asking about exemptions or, or some sort of discount for descendants of families who, who sold their lands to the states of Tennessee and North Carolina uh, for the park to be created. Yeah, thank you. So um, as the proposal stands now, and, and again, I want to just want to keep saying that we, we welcome any comments that you have um, through our, our, our Pepsi program that this is something that we need to further consider. But as the proposal stands now, that's not a feature. Um, of that type of discount being incorporated into the proposal. I just want to reiterate again that when we came up with these price points that we wanted to make sure that one, that those price points were as inclusive um, as possible for, and then so, secondly, as I mentioned, that this would not be a social economic uh, barrier for um, folks that want to continue to enjoy the national park. 
One thing I will mention um, in regards to the descendants that uh, there's questions. I know I've personally received questions about what we need a parking tag to go um, to do decoration days or um, family reunions. And I just want to assure descendants in particular that we will continue to utilize our special use permit, which allows for descendants to have decoration days and family reunions at no cost. Um, as you know, each of those visits are very unique. Some require uh, boat shuttle, vehicle shuttles, and so forth. And so we will continue to collaborate with those descendants to ensure that that tradition, uh, that traditional use in the park continues at no cost. Thank you. We've also received a few questions um, from park volunteers who, who've joined the call and just about if there would be exemptions for, for park staff and volunteers for the parking tag. And so they're, again, in the Floria Authority, there's exemptions for, for people who are doing business in the park. So the obvious um, situation is for park employees. And our park partners, like the Great Smoky Mountains Association, who have employees that operate our visitor centers across the park. And, and exemptions also for in volunteers who are doing work under a volunteer agreement. Uh, they're, they're just like employees coming to work that day to do business of the park. And again, these are all implementation issues that we will be looking at as this, if the program moves forward. And there are some complexities to that, as you can imagine, uh, that we'll have to work through because we certainly, with our, our 3,000 volunteers in the park, we want to make sure we're appropriately applying an exemption. For instance, if you, you have a one-time volunteer group who, who comes just to do one service day where they're picking up litter, what type of a tag might make the most sense for them? Maybe it's the, the one-day tag. So looking at, at how it's applied and, and the number of hours that, that volunteers who, who serve in the park would make the most sense for, for those tags. It's all a part of those, those implementation issues that you know, we simply need to dive into and, and look a little bit closer at. But, but those are some of the, the first thoughts that we've had as we look at that. Thank you. If this parking tag program is adopted, would, would the park stop receiving that, that federal funding or base funding that you showed in the presentation? Well, I certainly hope not. Um, that's, that's not our intention. Uh, for that federal funding to, to stop. Uh, again, one of the things that we're, we're trying to do here is take advantage of the opportunity that Florida provides us in that fee section that Dana talked about and to bump up our, our opportunities to better serve our visitors. Uh, we will continue to get congressionally appropriated dollars. The, the issue again is that, you know, if we get a, a slight bump in our, in our um, appropriated dollars, well, we average a 3% um, inflation rate, right, if you will, just the cost of doing business, which averages around 300 some thousand dollars. And so that is, it erodes our base of the spending. So it's imperative, again, that if we can increase our opportunities in the fee section of that, that bar graph that uh, Dana showed you earlier, that, in my opinion, will get us a seat at the table with the other size parks like the Smokies. So that again, we can raise that $2 per visitor up to the $15 and $18 uh, per visitor. Because again, we feel that our visitors deserve just as much of a service that a visitor at Yosemite or Yellowstone or Glacier uh, and the list goes on. Thank you. Once set, would the price of the parking tags remain the same going forward? So again, under the, the Floria Authority, all parks are encouraged to be reviewing their plans annually to make sure that the fees they're charging, uh, campground fees we've talked about, and parking fees under that Floria Authority, are meeting the operational needs appropriately. So they really should be assessed and, and thoughtfully looked at every year. Uh, as you can see, our track record isn't always great at doing that. We, you know, we haven't raised our campground rates in, in six years. We haven't raised our backcountry rates in 10 years. But the goal is that we are doing thoughtful reviews every year to look at that price point and see if it's still reasonable and feasible. 
Thank you. As I said, we had a lot of engagement on our question and answer board here, and we have a number of questions we couldn't get to, but I do want to let you know that we have a robust FAQ section on our website, and you can find the link to the Park It Forward program from our homepage. We also want to welcome each and every one of you to provide your feedback about the proposal during the public comment period, which will run through May 7th. The exact information on how to comment through that public comment period can also be found on our website. And at the end of this presentation, we will show this information on the screen for you to jot down. And, and now I would like to turn it back over to Superintendent Cassius Cash. All right, thank you, Kendra. And I want to thank each of you for, again, giving us your time for this hour to, to talk about a, a proposal that we're excited about and I hope through the presentation that Dana uh, has provided that uh, one is, clan is transparent and that the, the need is clear um, of what the Smokies need going forward. This park would be 100 years old in 12 years. And so we're trying to make decisions now to ensure that the protection and, and the preservation of this park is the way we found it, if not better. You know, if you've seen the film that I provided on our website, you will hear me say a statement, uh, something to the fact that the the sacrifices, and we've talked about that a little bit tonight, going back from the Eastern Band of the Cherokee Indian to the, to the settlers. And again, I remain so grateful uh, for those sacrifices that have given a lot of families from around the world the memories of being here in the park. But we're at a crossroad, as, as we, we talked about, and what we are wanting to do is to shift the weight of those sacrifices of local Tennesseans and North Carolinians that has been that we've talked about, shifting that to the shoulders of the millions of visitors that come to this park to for its maintaining uh, in perpetuity. Uh, in the park service, we're in the forever business. And we feel that with park fund with park funding or the parking fees, um, that ensures that we'll be able to do that in a way that we're proud and that you're proud of the work that we're doing here so that we can continue to work and generate new visitor experiences along with those visitor service. So I wanna thank you and have a good evening.